On a recent trip to Israel, my aunt Betsy and her husband Simon decided to go visit Herzliya. While they were there, they went out to eat at this place called Meat and Wine Co. It's a beautiful, magnificent two-story restaurant. They were seated at a table downstairs, and my aunt turns to the waiter and says, "You know, is it possible for us to have a table upstairs? We want to see the view." So they're given a table upstairs, and they go upstairs, and the waiter, a different waiter, comes over. We sat down, and our waiter came over, and he was telling us the specials and kibitzing with him a little bit. You know, it was very jovial. And, and as he was walking away, he said, "By the way, if you need anything, my name is Barak." And I immediately got some kind of a feeling in me, and I turned to Simon and I said, "We have to know what his mother's name is." So my uncle Simon calls him back and he says, "Hey, Barak, is your mom's name Orna?" And Barak says, "Yes." And he said it, and I didn't process it. It was like you know, you hear, you see these stories that you just don't hear what he's saying, and you're like, "What?" And that was how I felt. And I, said, "What did you say?" And he said, "Orna." At which point my aunt says to him. Did you, by any chance, fight last summer in the war with Gaza, Operation Protective Edge? And he says, "Yeah. How do you know?" My aunt says, "Well, I've got your name on my kitchen cabinet." During the war, you call a phone number and they give you the name of a soldier to pray for, a soldier who's fighting in the army. The name she get was uh, Barak Sanofona, and that's uh, my name, Barak Ben Orna. And what's even stranger is, my aunt tells Barak. That two weeks ago, she walked into her kitchen in Beverly Hills, and she saw his name, and she began praying for him. And while she was praying for him, she turns to God and says, "You know, I don't even know if he's alive. It would be nice to meet him and to see how he's doing." I went to Israel. It wasn't planned. I went to Herzliya. It wasn't planned. We went to this restaurant. We went to this table. He was our waiter. It was just a powerful message to me that Hashem. Is is right there. Betsy pray for me to to come back home safe, and I came back home safe. When you realize that someone prays for you to come back, it makes the heart uh, very very warm. Around three weeks ago, Barak sent an email to my aunt. He told me that the next day he started putting on tefillin that he hadn't put on tefillin. In years, I felt that uh, this is a mark from God or something. Uh, this was unbelievable. We live in a world of seven billion people, and it's hard to imagine that the Creator of the universe is looking after little old me. It's hard to believe that He's orchestrating every event. In our life, and sometimes it's hard to feel like when I talk to him, he's actually listening. On Rosh Hashanah, the day God created man, we remind ourselves that He is actually paying very, very close attention to every detail of our life. We remind ourselves that He is behind the events we call coincidence, accidents, or chance, and we remind ourselves that life is a gift. Should not be taken for granted, and every breath you take is his special way of saying you matter. So reach out to him and talk to him. Ask him for a year of happiness and health, or whatever else you might need, because he's waiting to hear from you. When the war with Gaza broke out in 2008, Devir Emanuelov and his unit were stationed at the border, getting ready for a ground invasion. Like every good Jewish mother, Mrs. Dalia Emanuelov was extremely concerned about the safety of her son. She made Devir promise that he will text her before he goes into Gaza. Mati lo Devir, im ata nichnas le Gaza, ani chayvet la daat mizeh. Tesamesh li et amilim, ani shomer al atzmi. This is the sign between us. At 
Sadly, that was the last time Mrs. Emanuel have heard from her son. סמל ראשון, דביר אמנואלוף מגבעת זאב, הוא ההרוג הראשון של מבצע עופרת יצוקה. עמך סגבנו, תארנו נורא. She was completely shattered. She couldn't believe that she lost her son so soon after losing her husband. הרגשתי שקיבלתי סטירת לחי תוך פחות משלוש שנים, סטירת לחי נוספת. התחילה השבעה, ואני כמו איזה זומבי, מרחפת, שום דבר לא מרגישה, אני מאוד כועסת, לא מברכת, לא מתפללת. A few months later, it was Dvir's birthday, and Mrs. Emanuel was coming back from an emotional visit at Dvir's cover on her herzl. When she walked into her home, she was overcome with this deep sense of loneliness. אני מסתובבת בין קירות הבית, והבית ריק, ממש ריק. ואני מרגישה כאילו הקירות צורכים את הריקנות. בעלי לא פה, דביר לא פה, הבנות שתהיינה בריאות גם לא פה, אז אני לבד בבית. She sat down on a chair and burst into tears. And for the first time since דביר was killed, she started talking to Hashem. אמרתי לו, מה זה? למה? עשיתי משהו לא טוב? אם עשיתי משהו רע, אני צריכה לדעת. ואז החלטתי שאני דורשת. אני רוצה סימן שאני במציאות. אם זה חלום, זה חלום רע. A short while later, her youngest daughter called her up, and she told her that there's this big concert going on in Kiryat Chutzot by this famous Israeli singer, Meir Banai. הלכנו להופעה, ואנחנו יושבות שם בספסלים. Five minutes before the concert begins, she feels a tap on her shoulder. She turns around, and she sees there's a three-year-old child. הוא נראה לי כמו מלאך, יפה תואר, חיוך של זהב, טלטלי זהב, עיניים כחולות. ואני אומרת לו, שלום, איך קוראים לך? אז הוא אומר לי, אשל. אתה רוצה להיות חבר שלי? אני שואלת. הוא אומר לי, כן. אתה רוצה לשבת לידי? Before אשל could respond, she hears אשל's father, בני. אשל, אשל, come over here, sit next to אבא and דביר. בוא תשב לידי וליד דביר. אני שומעת את השם דביר, ואני מסתובבת לאחור, ואני רואה את האבא מחזיק תינוק. ואני אומרת לו, סליחה, בן כמה התינוק? הוא אומר לי, חצי שנה? הוא נולד לפני עופרת יצוקה או אחרי? אז הוא אומר לי, אחרי. She says, I'm sorry for being so intrusive, but why did you name him Dvir? Benny looked at her and said, you know, we actually never shared this with anybody, not even at Dvir's bris, but if you're asking, I'll tell you. He pointed at his wife who was sitting next to him, and he said, when my wife was in her eighth month, she went to the doctor for a routine checkup. I did a checkup of ultrasound. ובבדיקה עצמה התגלה סוג של מום לעובר. כשהלכתי לקבל ייעוץ רפואי ממומחה, אמר לנו שזה הר ציביר, וככל הנראה הוא ייוולד לתוך איזשהו מערך שנצטרך אולי דיאליזה וכולי. We were completely devastated by the news. When my wife came home that day after the doctor's visit, she turned on the news and she hears that the first Israeli soldier just got killed. His name? דביר אמנואלוב. משהו טוב נחת עליי, ואני אומרת לקדוש ברוך הוא, אתה תעשה איתי את החסד, תרפא לי את הילד, ואני אקרא אותו על שם, על שם דביר. A month later, we gave birth to a beautiful, healthy baby boy, and we named him דביר. ואז אני אומרת לו, אתה יודע, אני אימא שלו. צריך להבין שהפסטיבל עצמו זה שמונת אלפים איש, זה שמונת אלפים כיסאות, זה חושך. מה הסיכוי שאישה מגבעת זאב ואישה מירושלים ישבו שורה תחת שורה, נפלנו אישה על רעותה, ממש ככה, אנחנו התחבקנו והתנשקנו. היא אומרת לי, דביר שולח לך חיבוק גדול דרכנו. אני שומעת את המילים האלה. אני הבנתי, אני ידעתי, ואני קיבלתי תשובה ישירה. You know, we all have times in our lives when we feel abandoned and alone. We feel like there's nobody really listening up there. There's nobody watching over us up there. It's in times like these that we have to commit to turn to Hashem and connect to Hashem and talk to Hashem in your own language. It doesn't matter where. While you're driving to work, washing dishes or folding laundry, Hashem wants us to ask Him to help us feel His presence in our lives. Try it. The results can be surprising. It was in February 2011, and Rabbi Yotav Eliyach was leading a trip to Israel for a group of 50 American high school students. 
the last stop of the trip, right before they went to the airport, was the cemetery in Har Herzl. As you can imagine, walking through the cemetery and looking at the graves of the young soldiers who gave up their lives and hearing their heroic stories can be a very emotional and moving experience. The most difficult place for me to visit is Har Herzl. Because instead of the young burying the old, the old are burying the young. So as Rabbi Eliach is explaining to the students the sacrifice that these children, these young soldiers and their families have made, he suddenly sees just a few feet away from him, there's an elderly couple crying over a grave. Suddenly, everything I've been describing, what it means to parents and families, it's right there. We see a mother and a man. I said, it's very clear, this is Abba and Ima coming to visit a cavern. He sees that on the tombstone, there's a picture of a young Israeli soldier. His name was Erez Deri. One of us leaned over and asked her, Mrs. Derry starts telling them how Erez was a paratrooper and was tragically killed in 2006. You see the kids' faces. Everybody's in pain. Everybody realizes as much as they can at that age what this meant to them. Then she tells them something that left them speechless. She goes, last night I had a dream. Erez אבל אני הייתי מאוד רוצה שתכניסו ספר תורה על שמי. להכניס ספר תורה זה כאילו להכניס אותי לחופה. And here's the spookiest part. He says, go to her Herzl, in the dream. יש אנשים טובים שם. יבואו אנשים טובים שהם יעזרו לך להכניס ספר תורה. Something about this woman just sparked a connection with us, and we as a cohort decided to take this project on to fundraise for Sefer Torah to dedicate in memory of her son. One of us leaned over and said, Shana Abba, we're coming back with the Sefer Torah just like you dreamed. When this was a group of secular kids and religious kids, kids from day schools and kids from public schools, it was bizarre, but we were sort of possessed by this need to, to do it. The next year in February 2012, they came back with a brand new Sefer Torah and they went to Malay Adumim and they wrote the last letters of the Sefer Torah in Erez's room. His uniform is hanging pressed against the wall. On his desk we had the Sefer Torah open and we're there to write the last two Atiyot. I really felt very happy. I really felt very happy. It was really the Lord Israel with us. You can feel the excitement in the air. When they closed it up and they started walking down into the street, People started dancing. You had Chilonim, Datiyim, Ashkenazim, Sfaradim. You looked up on all the porches. There were people dancing on porches. Every type of Jew you can imagine was involved in this. From those who gave the money, to those who were in write on, from the Sofer, to the band who played, to the two chief rabbis of Malay Adumin, to the policemen who were standing in the streets to keep everybody quiet. I'm sure everybody will never forget that day. Am Yisrael was there. When I first heard the story, it made me feel so proud to be part of the Jewish family. Just knowing that Jews can meet anywhere in the world, whether it's in a cemetery in Israel or in an airport in Beijing, China, it doesn't matter where. There's an immediate, natural, warm feeling of connection, regardless of how different we look on the outside. <laughs> it's one goof, it's one neshama. This past November, the Rosen family from Miami, Florida, was celebrating the birth of a new baby boy. Everybody was really excited and all the preparations for the bris were underway. There was just one minor detail that still had to be taken care of. We were trying to choose a name to name our new baby and we didn't have any clarity, any name in particular that we wanted to name. So Mrs. Rosen decided to pick up a phone and call her father and ask him for a suggestion. He told her that naming a child is a very special parental experience. Parents have this special divine assistance in knowing what to name their child. So he advised her to use her intuition, her gut feeling. But then he said, if you can't come up with any ideas, let me just mention that we had a very special grandfather in the family. His name was David Chai. My father suggested that we sleep on it, and the morning of the birth, we look at the baby and see if we have a strong feeling when we look at him, knowing what the name should be. The morning of the birth, Mr. and Mrs. Rosen finally came up 
with a right name. Netanel Yaakov. After the bris, we get a phone call from my mother-in-law who is on her way back to Savannah. She got a call from someone else in Savannah, Georgia, saying how blown away she was that we named after the two victims of the terrorist attack that had just taken place that Friday. In Israel, there was this Palestinian who came out of nowhere and shot at a car and killed father and son, Netanel, 18 years old, and Yaakov, 44 years old. Netanel, who was a nahag, was a man who 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 was a man
full use of his hand. היד לא תפקדה כרגיל, גם היום היא לא מתפקדת כרגיל. Fast forward seven years, 2001, during the Intifada. Erez Shmulian was married with a kid living in a settlement called Har Bracha. One day, he was driving with his family out of the settlement. פתאום, יוצאים שלושה מחבלים, מתחילים לראות עליהם. הם היו לבושים במדי צהל. זה היו רגעים קשים מאוד. נפגן, נפצענו בראש. דם ניתז לכל עבר. He looked at his wife, his wife was covered in blood. She was already saying Shema Yisrael. He looked at his kid, his kid was covered in blood, yelling, screaming and crying. He thought of speeding up and getting away, but there was a car blocking the road. The only option he had was to turn the car around and escape back to the settlement. But if any of you have ever driven on those narrow Israeli roads, you know how difficult and time-consuming it can be just to turn around. But because of Erez's hand injury, Erez had something on his steering wheel called a spinner knob that helped him maneuver the car easier and faster. And in the name of God, I could have done it in the speed of the parasa, with the tapuach, with the egekoach, and to get out of it as much as possible. Those few seconds spelled the difference between the life and death for Erez and his family. The first one in the hospital, the first one in the hand, היא זאת שהצילה אותנו מהאירוע המסוכן ב-2001. If not for his hand injury, he never would have had the spinner knob, and he never would have been able to get away in time. אם זה לא היה, אינני יודע מה היה קורה. As we travel on the road of life, all of us encounter difficult and challenging moments. Sometimes life can feel so unfair. We just want to throw our hands up in the air and ask, Why is this happening to me? This story reminds us that it's precisely in those moments of stagnation and paralysis that Hashem, who sees the bigger picture, is actually looking out for us. And what may appear to be a tragedy or a disappointment today can end up saving a life tomorrow. If there was ever a picture in the dictionary of a Jewish farmer, it would be Ira Hashem. Zimmerman. From very, very young age, I was going to work with my father in the fields. I was driving the tractor, and this is uh, the way of living. Because he grew up without a Torah education, without mitzvahs, without Shabbos, he has a passion for using his farming skills to promote Torah and mitzvahs, which is why he volunteers to harvest the wheat from Matzah Shmura every year, and he also volunteers a ton of his time and efforts for Karen Ashvias, an organization that that helps farmers keep the laws of Shemitah. I feel it's like uh, bad tshuva is making a tshuva on the thing he did before. Seven years ago was the sixth year of the Shemitah cycle. It turns out that that year, it rained in Israel very late in the harvesting season. All the center of Israel was not good for the Matzah Shemura, and also the north was raining this year. So only what we have to do is to go to the south of Israel. Fortunately, Iran's his friends found a field in the south of Israel, next to the Gaza border. Only problem was, No farmer wants to work in a field next to the Gaza border. The tension between Israel and Gaza was palpable. They were at the brink of war. But then, because I grew up in this region, so I know the region. I know it's a little bit hot, a little bit risky. Sometimes they shoot, sometimes they throw stones. So, okay, let's do it and uh, keep going. The problem is that the kibbutznik, the farmer says, you can't take it now, it's not ready yet. It's still a little bit green. You need to wait another one and a half, two weeks. And we tell them, look, we don't wait. This next year is Shemitah. We need to have double of the amounts. We can't take the risk. Another rain will come. We need to take it now. They worked overtime from dawn till dusk, from sunrise till sunset. They tried their best to do it as fast as possible because they didn't want rain to ruin any of their chances to take the wheat to be used for Matzah Shmura. In addition, they needed double the amount of wheat they would usually harvest because the next year was Shemitah. We need to take double, so it's 3,000 ton. While they were on the field on the tractor, Ira remembers his partner saying to him, Ira, I can feel that the ground beneath us is shaking. It feels kind of unstable. But it wasn't like something which is not usual because it's a field. It's a big tractor. We have rocks, we have holes. And within two to three days, they managed to harvest the entire field. They sent shiploads of the wheat to all the major cities in Israel. for those bakeries to have for Matzah Shemur and also to store for the next Pesach for Shemitah. Two days later, it was 
all over the news. כך זה נראה לפני זמן קצר, בשטח המנהרה בה נתפסו 13 המחבלים שניסו להיכנס לקיבוץ סופה. Thank you.